Hey everybody, it is Taylor of Summer Del Sol here. Thank you so much for joining me. Today I'm excited to say I'm mostly just buttoning things up for potentially my first drive. Alright, let's walk around because we know there's plenty to do here. I'll be getting this e-brake up and out of the way for road hazards. Gotta get this gauge pod at least zip tied down or something to secure it. This whole bit of wiring harness at least needs to be in place attached to this frame so it's not jiggling around everywhere. The oh so trusty coolant overflow tank needs to be secured. I will zip tie this big old box of electronics up and out of the way for now. And since I'm going to keep finding objects that need to be moved, let's go ahead and start by getting this wiring harness out of the way. I promise going forward these will be secured in a much better way. This is simply to get the first test drive around the neighborhood at a very slow speed. I think the air intake filter is the prime example of how badly I want to drive this thing. This is absolutely going to have to call for a custom bracket that I will bend and make later, but for now, I can kind of make do with some zip ties. My main concern is trying to be considerate of where this sits around this hose here, but like I mentioned, this is really just going to be actually lower the neighborhood speeds because I just want to be super cautious. With the left side attached to the bracket on the block, I was then able to use one of the forward-leaning tubes to kind of secure this up and create some tension to get it away from the suspension tower. With both sides loosely attached, I was now able to tighten and adjust to ensure that clearance from the shock tower, but most importantly, the headers. I definitely didn't want the finest parts from eBay sitting and melting, frankly, all over my headers. Those are actually nice. And of course, a clearance check and little jam out session is always required. In retrospect, I definitely should have mounted up the wiring harness to the frame before solidifying where the air filter was going to sit, but y'all know who you're watching. What's new? These sensors were also very much flirting with the headers, and I wanted to ensure they were all snug together and out of the way. You'll notice there's definitely a ton of wiring all around. This is because I just want to get everything running in good order, add what I need, and then kind of reduce from there. And at this point, I deserved a heat break. Listen, I'm from the south. We don't do cold here. Tame as it may be. After getting the upper wiring components secured, it was time to do the lower components. Once I felt good that those were all out of the way, it was time to move on. Ooh, fun time. check. Had to do it blind. Yep, that'll work. Next, I repeated the same process on the passenger side, making sure I worked from the lower side up to get some of these loose wires out of the way. I was trying to be extra delicate this time because it was cold and these are 30 year old wires. And of course you can't forget all your hose clamps. Fret not, I did scoot this hose forward a little bit more after clamping it so there will be no leaks. Another hose that needed clamps was the rear coolant hose behind the engine. You definitely want to make sure that's secure and it does need clamps to be so. If you've been following along you may recall I did not like this hose. It was definitely a struggle to get on, but thankfully the clamp was a lot more cooperative. As I'm going along, I'm trying to get a good visual representation of how everything's working. I think this looks good. I'm getting a little click on the steering, but nothing major. And of course, one of the most important things to double, triple, quadruple check, brake lines. Genuinely, I couldn't tell you how many times I turned that steering wheel left and right to make sure I didn't have any sort of clearance issues like I'm having here with that upper control arm and to make sure I had enough slack on each side so there wouldn't be any sort of tension. Here you can see where I definitely have too much slack on the passenger side. I was in good shape turning the wheel to the left, but when I turned right, that line would dip down really low, almost down to the subframe, and I did not want anything from the street catching that line. I tightened it up and was ready to move on. Another thing I'd been putting off was how to attach this speedometer cable. You can see here where it stems from the transmission and was then later run over the bell housing underneath the frame and then back behind the engine. I currently have it laying over the brake booster lines, over the wiring harness, and in the back of the gauge pod. It's a little tense in certain spots, but I think it'll be okay. More clamps! They are everywhere, and I'm sure there's something still missing where it needs to be. Cross your fingers for me that I find it before it's too late. Whatever it may be. 
Speaking of, I had this on as a loose fit so I could get that radiator in earlier, but now it is time to seal it up once more. And just like that, it's clamped back in place. I know this is kind of obnoxious and tedious, but these are good things to look for for anyone else building one of these. While not entirely comprehensive, these are the things I managed to not overlook, like this fuse box up front that was interfering with my clutch pedal. I checked to make sure it was actually clear, and then it was on to the next task. Clipping zip ties! I told you I'd find this again, Jim. And it's a good thing, because there are zip ties everywhere in this car. It's not the biggest deal to clip them, but I wanted to make sure there was no interference with anything where something might be resonating, hitting something else, or god forbid melting. After doing a few more walk-arounds and seeing if there was anything else missing, I felt like I was ready to check my fluids. But of course, there were several more things I actually needed to do. I can see one of them here now. But in the meantime, coolant levels look good. Give it a nice little tippy tap. At this point, I was quite pleased to see that the oil leak is not quite as bad as I might have thought. Just sitting here, it doesn't really seem to be losing all that much, which actually probably means I'm burning it. But that was never news to me with this car, so I'm gonna send it. Can we also take a moment to appreciate the original Miata dipstick? Next, I moved on to my brake fluid levels. Thankfully, this had stayed consistent for more than a week. It's currently a little bit over the max, but I don't think that's gonna be the end of the world. And lastly, I checked my clutch fluid. Looks good. At this point, it felt right to go ahead and put all four of the wheels back on. Since the car was up in the air still, I just had a loose fit on these, nothing torqued down just yet. But there's always something, isn't there? With fresh eyes on the car and sleepless nights from thinking about it, I remember my dash pot was really finicky and I was only getting about two inches of pedal travel on the accelerator. In the past, something must have bent this throttle pulley because I wasn't getting clearance from the throttle body. Since the adjuster screw wasn't really making contact with the dash pot anyway, I went ahead and unscrewed it and I had plenty of clearance as you can see now. And since I had earlier tried to fix the symptom instead of the problem, it was time to reposition my throttle cable bracket back into its rightful place. Thankfully that was easy enough to rotate and I had it back in place in no time. I adjusted the cable and it too went right back in place. What do you know, there was one more clamp. I'm sure plenty of you saw this earlier in that clip I mentioned, and it's thankfully now back where it belongs. Okay, for real this time, everything seems to be where it needs to be, and it's time to start addressing some other little quirks about the car. So these are the original 14-inch daisies from the 1990 Miata. I'm taping up the rear section here to make sure I'm not going to get any sort of rub from these tires, as I'm not familiar with the offset of these wheels. For standard exoset sizing, you definitely want to make sure you've got your math based on a 15 by 8 zero offset wheel. We always knew that those would clear, so as long as you have that as the foundation for what you want going forward, you should be good. Since I plan to run a 15 by 9 wheel, I'm going to need a negative 13 offset. If you need more beef for more power, you can run a 15 by 10, which will require a negative 32 offset. Anything past that, and you're insane. And because inevitably there's always one final, final thing on the car. I strung up my sketchy gas tank hose so this wouldn't hit the frame. I was skeptical too. Holy cow, now it's time to sweep and make sure there's not gonna be anything that will puncture a tire because I want to enjoy what's about to be my test drive. I did a final look under the car to see where the lowest point was. You can see here, it's where my headers dump. I also wanted to ensure there was nothing around the drive shaft here, but it looks like we're clear. And a shifter knob is handy. Thankfully I had the old shifter knob for my NB, though now I'm mad about it because it makes me realize just how green my car is. It's turquoise in the sun, I swear. This is where it starts to feel like it's happening. Steering wheel attached, raccoon hands rubbed. Now for the first test in the air.
I'm so shaky. Oh, oops, but happy, right? So happy, but like that's just really scary. <laughs> yeah, it's like, all of it. Will it go in gear? Will it stop? Yeah. And that's just the test run. Now you know how Frankenstein felt. Woo! Real nervous. <laughs> Well, sure, you could obviously say that since you didn't mess with anything in the gearing, you didn't remove the engine from the transmission, of course it's gonna activate. I have anxiety, so I wanted to check. It's how my brain works, and also made dropping the car just as stressful as testing it out. That thing was up there. I dropped the back first because the e-brake was activated, and I can tell you I still check this thing a million times. This part of the video has been greatly condensed. I also need to get a much lower profile jack because this thing is a nightmare to get up and down. This thing is slammed. I got the BB jack so I could work on my mom's car too, but now it's time I think to get a dedicated one. As I mentioned, this thing is on the ground. I measured 5 inches from the rear jacking point, which was enough, but I'll need to raise it later. Car's down, let's ride! super light clutch, where that clutch is actuated, and the lack of power steering, I have a little bit to get reacquainted with for this car. That said, it is all manageable and I'm proud to say I did not stall like I thought I might have with my now daily driver having a much heavier flywheel. This is just pure joy. It's currently ticking like a time bomb, but I'm hoping in time, once the oil fully circulates, that should be in better shape. Thinking about some Brotella, also thinking about some Royal Perp. Let me know what your recommendations are. You can see how, unfortunately, my steering is very off-center. That should be an easy fix. I'm not too worried about it right now. The thing drives! I'd say that's a happy face right there. Thank you guys so much for watching and following along. This is a huge step, but there's so much more left to do on the car, and I hope you'll stick around to help me finish it. Even when I do, still many more automotive adventures to come. Thanks again, and I'll catch you next time!